when people think of neurotransmitters, it's easy to think of dopamine, it's easy to think of serotonin. A lot of times we'll even think of things like oxytocin. We think of the brain, right? Neurotransmitters, neuro, brain. Like, we don't think about neurotransmitters and how they are connected with fat loss and how we have lots of different neurotransmitters that do different things that send sort of an impetus for something to happen within the body. So in this particular case, I wanna teach you how to increase a particular neurotransmitter that is probably the most associated with fat loss. When I say it, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, duh, except we need to learn how it works specifically and then I have very specific ways that you can increase it safely to get the most out of your fat loss. So after today's video, I put a link down below for a sponsor on this channel, which is Timeline Nutrition. This is not something that is going to impact neurotransmitters, but it is going to impact your mitochondria. So Timeline utilizes urolithin A, so it increases what's called mitophagy. So this is autophagy within the actual mitochondria. So in our muscle cells, we have mitochondria. These mitochondria, well, a lot of cells, our brain too, obviously, but what happens is these mitochondria, as we age, they become weaker and more decrepit, and they don't produce energy very well. Well, autophagy within a mitochondria is where the mitochondria can sort of consume unused portions of itself to ultimately become stronger. So it's like survival of the fittest. Now, with that, you have stronger mitochondria that produce energy, but you do need some help with that. So urolithin A has been published in multiple studies to induce mitophagy. So that link down below is for a patented form of urolithin A from a company called Timeline Nutrition. It's a 10% off discount link. So top line of the description just underneath this video is something that you notice pretty quick. I notice my recovery is way faster when I take it compared to when I don't. So again, that link top line of the description. Okay, let's talk about this neurotransmitter for a second. I'm talking about something that is produced in the body, produced through hypothalamic adrenal axis. We're talking about norepinephrine. Now, before you click off this video, I want you to do two things. I want you to watch the video, but I also want you to please drop a comment down below because it's going to help the algorithm get this video where it needs to go. Okay, so the thing with norepinephrine, when you sprint, when you uh, do cardio, when you are in a caloric deficit or fasting or even under a certain amount of stress or cold exposure, even sauna, you have an increase in norepinephrine. And its job is to essentially like liberate some fuel but also just give you energy. It's like cascade and a bunch of different things. But what we've kind of been neglecting when it comes down to norepinephrine and fat loss is how it can actually allow a fat cell to release fat. So I'm gonna give you a little school lesson on how this works real quick. There's a study that was published in Advances in Pharmacology that looked at this closely. Essentially, norepinephrine is released, okay, after activity or during activity or some stress. Norepinephrine then binds to something that is called a beta adrenergic receptor. Okay, once this happens, there is a specific enzyme that releases, and this enzyme triggers the release, or actually triggers what is called ATP, the energy in our cells. The energy takes ATP and turns it into what is called cyclic adenosine monophosphate, CAMP. In fact, caffeine can actually stimulate CAMP quite a bit. But right now, it just sounds like a bunch of acronyms and weird stuff, like what is it that CAMP does that's associated with massive fat burning? Well, CAMP activates something that is called protein kinase A, not that important right now, which then activates two really important things. It activates an enzyme known as hormone-sensitive lipase and something called perilipid. Okay, perilipid then travels to a fat cell, a triglyceride, okay? And the perilipid says, hey, open up your doors, here comes hormone-sensitive lipase. And hormone-sensitive lipase then releases the fatty acids that are in that triglyceride. So you've got a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. Okay, that's what a fat cell of triglyceride looks like. Hormone-sensitive lipase acts like a pair of scissors, cuts those off, the three fatty acids flow into the bloodstream, and voila, you burn them. So that's pretty simple, but if it was always that simple, then the moment that we exercise, we'd magically burn fat, right? So that's where things get kind of interesting because on our actual fat cell itself, we have what are called alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, okay? And these alpha-2 adrenergic receptors are really important when it comes down to whether a fat is released into the bloodstream or hunkers down and stands, puts up a fight, right? Essentially, when these alpha-2 adrenergic receptors are stimulated, are acted upon, it actually stops this whole process. It stops the enzyme at the very beginning of this whole process. So it is a rate-limiting step, essentially. So once this happens, those receptors are occupied, it, fat doesn't release. So how do we get around that? Well, 
Where this research originally came out for me was when I was researching something called yohimbine and raulcine, which are powerful fat burners. The way that they work is they block the alpha-2 adrenergic receptor. So because they block it, they allow lipolysis to occur. So what I mean by this is like there's other rodent model studies that explain it in another way really well. The more alpha-2 receptors that are on a fat cell, the more prone that fat cell is to growing and becoming fatter, okay? The less alpha-2 receptors, the less prone it is to becoming fatter and the more prone it is to actually liberate itself and burn, burn the fat. So when you occupy some of these with like something like caffeine or yohimbine or raulcine or some of these other things that act upon norepinephrine or act upon these alpha-2 adrenergic receptors rather, then you put yourself in a spot where fat can be liberated more. So how do we increase norepinephrine? There's a few ways. For one, doing fasted workouts. This is where people get a little confused because they say, well, the evidence says that like weight loss is gonna be the same with a fasted workout versus not fasted workout, and I push more weight and I work out harder when I have fuel in my system, and that may be the case. But I'm telling you, as long as calories are equated for throughout the day, you will probably burn more fat as a percentage simply because you're gonna be in a fasted state where your body is stressed and norepinephrine can be released more. Whether you are into intermittent fasting or not, one of the reasons that fasting is effective isn't just because of the caloric deficit, that's the big one, but it's also because you have a nice sustained release of norepinephrine floating around. The downside with norepinephrine is it means you're in a highly sympathetic nervous system state, which means that you're stressed and you're not relaxed, right? Now you may feel mentally relaxed, but if you're in a sympathetic nervous system state, you're not relaxed. And unfortunately, calm, cool, and collected is good for recovery, but might not be the best for fat loss. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a cool head. I'm saying that you want your body to kind of have that fight mode, because that fight or flight, that adrenaline, that norepinephrine, is going to allow you to utilize fat more. From a very, very core fundamental sense, that's the reason, right? So when you stimulate norepinephrine through shock, like cold exposure, hot exposure, heat exposure, sprinting, hardcore resistance training, hard training, VO2 max training, really pushing it and stressing yourself, fasting, caloric restriction, even caffeine, right? These things are all activating this system that is saying, okay, a little bit of stress, let's liberate some fat so we can like put this stress to use, right? The body is taking care of us for that. So when we think neurotransmitters, we always come back to like, oh, GABA, or we come back to serotonin or dopamine. Yeah, those are super important and play obviously a fundamental role. But when it comes down to pure, plain and simple fat loss, we need to focus on how do we increase norepinephrine. Now, once you've done that, how do you increase the efficiency of norepinephrine? Because what we've seen with the literature with like yohimbine, raulcine, and to a smaller degree caffeine, is that what it does is it doesn't just increase norepinephrine, it increases the ability for epinephrine to act on a fat cell. So now, instead of like three or four darts hitting a fat cell to try to get it to release, you're getting like 30 darts that are getting, coming at it, trying to get it to release. So you have more epinephrine and a stronger affinity for that epinephrine to hit the fat cell and release fat into the bloodstream. The most important thing that you have to know though is mobilization from something like caffeine, yohimbine, raulcine, any of these fat burners, but especially yohimbine and raulcine because they're so powerful, is they are mobilizing agents. So adrenaline, norepinephrine will mobilize the fat, but it will not burn it for you. So one of the things that I recommend people do is like go get in a sauna, get a little adrenaline going, or jump in a cold plunge, get some epinephrine going, and then do some cardio, if you have the luxury of being able to do that. Or doing your cardio in a fasted state with some yohimbine or some caffeine or some green tea. These things are vetted and they do work if we focus on the fundamental rules of what our body's trying to do. Fight or flight, it's gonna burn some fat. I'll see you tomorrow.